Hi, I'm Carl Herzog, public historian for the USS Constitution Museum. You know, in the 1790s, the world was turning into a pretty complicated place for the young United States of America. With its merchant ships in the Mediterranean being seized by Barbary Corsairs, Congress had reluctantly agreed to begin building a standing navy. But once deals had been made with the Barbary states of North Africa to pay tribute in exchange for safe passage of those merchant vessels, Congress decided to suspend construction of three of the six frigates that were underway in the U.S. However, no sooner had that happened in 1796, and relationships with France started falling apart. French privateers were now seizing American merchant ships in both the Caribbean and along the North American East Coast. War was never formally declared with France, but a navy was immediately put together and sent to the Caribbean to begin protecting U.S. merchant interests there. It would be America's first international conflict and the first international overseas deployment of the U.S. fledgling U.S. Navy. They weren't ready for it. When construction had begun on the six frigates in 1794, there was no established naval officer corps, nor was there any pool of qualified enlisted sailors. With no established navy, the only maritime force that the U.S. had was the Revenue Cutter Service, the precursor to the modern U.S. Coast Guard that was tasked with enforcing U.S. Uh, customs laws but they were nowhere near ready to begin fighting off French privateers. As a result of this, most of the captains put in charge of the ships in the beginning of the U.S. Navy were either aging veterans of the American Revolution who had participated in the Continental Navy, which had been disbanded years earlier, or they were mariners that simply had little or no naval experience to begin with. The most senior captains in the U.S. Navy were the ones who had been assigned the task of being superintendents of the construction of the six frigates beginning in 94. Benjamin Stoddard, the first secretary of the Navy, was a tobacco merchant from Maryland who had been in the cavalry in the American Revolution and had no naval experience either. However, it was up to Stoddard to not only assemble and build the ships for the new Navy, but begin to develop the infrastructure that would allow the Navy to continue on into the future. Just getting the ships that were available ready and sent to sea was a formidable task in its own right. With USS Constitution and the other frigates not yet ready to sail, the government turned to buying and converting merchant ships and converting some of the revenue cutters for use in the new Navy. In total, eight merchant ships ended up being purchased and converted and were ready to go by the spring of 1798. The merchant ships were not nimble sailors to begin with, and their performance was made far worse by the fact that their new captains were now overloading the decks with heavy guns and too many of them, far more than the ships were ever designed or able to take. These ships were not even intended to go into battle against French warships, but merely to protect the merchant ships against French privateers. A number of the merchant ships ended up having to be refitted with lighter ordnance after their initial maneuvering proved to be so bad. But with their lighter weaponry, it made the presence of the newly built frigates even more important to the Navy. In addition to the struggles with the ships themselves, Stoddard was struggling with the captains in his new navy. John Barry, who was the senior most captain of them all, uh, had argued that he didn't want to sail during the hurricane season, particularly in the Caribbean, and felt that the navy should plan around that contingency. Stoddard had to inform Barry that the merchant trade operated year-round, and consequently the defense of that trade was going to operate year-round. Finding competent mariners to sail in the U.S. Navy was also proving to be an issue that was delaying the sailing of some ships. USS Constitution was stuck in Boston Harbor for several weeks while, at least according to its captain, uh, Samuel Nicholson, he struggled to find enough Marines and crew to man the ship. 
For a ship that would turn out to have such an amazing career later on, Constitution's first outings were not particularly stellar, and most of that can be laid at the feet of her first captain, Samuel Nicholson. Nicholson had a horrible reputation as an officer, and his performance as captain on Constitution pretty much backed up that reputation. Nicholson managed to get Constitution underway from Boston Harbor for the first time in July of 1798. After patrolling the American coastline for quite a while, he encountered the first ship that he attempted to seize off of Hatteras in September of 1798. This ship was the 24-gun ship Niger. The Niger was flying a British banner when Constitution came up alongside and Nicholson's crew boarded the ship. Although Niger's captain at the time was a French royalist, there was in fact British cargo on board the ship and a number of both British and American passengers. Despite this, Nicholson managed to come to the conclusion that this was in fact a French privateer and he seized the ship and brought it back to Norfolk, Virginia. Nicholson then kept Constitution at anchor in Chesapeake for more than a month while he waited for the prize court to adjudicate the settlement of the seizure of the Niger. However, as it was obvious to the court that this was in fact a British vessel and not a French privateer, not only was the ship forced to be returned to its owners, but an $11,000 fine was ordered by the courts to be paid to the owners of the ship. Needless to say, the government was furious with Nicholson, and their ire was made worse when it came to light that Nicholson, who would have been held responsible personally for that fine, didn't have the money to pay it. Consequently, the Navy, the government, had to go back to Congress to get authorized an appropriation for the $11,000 to pay off Nicholson's fine. After spending the late fall in Boston, again complaining that he couldn't get enough crew or that he had other reasons for not being able to get underway, Nicholson eventually set sail for the Caribbean for the winter of 1798 to 1799. In January of 1799, off the coast of Bermuda, Nicholson's second attempt at seizing uh, another ship ended up in him making the wrong call again. Nicholson had sighted the sails of two separate ships, one a French privateer and the other a British ship that had been seized by that privateer. Nicholson made chase and the privateer fled, but he managed to track down the British ship Despite the fact that it had been seized by the French privateer, Nicholson concluded that since it was a British ship, he could not in fact take it and was obligated to return it to the French prize crew on board, which he did, allowing them to then take it back to Guadeloupe. The government was again furious with Nicholson for turning over a, a French captured ship back to the enemy that had captured it. It was a less than stellar performance to say the least and as a result Stoddard began looking for ways that he could keep Nicholson out of any real responsible duty or particularly important roles. Unfortunately, Nicholson's family connections made it impossible for Stoddard to just get rid of him, despite the calls from some in the government to do just that. And so in the spring of 1799, he assigned Nicholson to a shore duty serving as the superintendent of a new 74-gun ship of the line to be built in Boston. He pretty much suspected that Nicholson would decline the assignment and then depart the service, but Nicholson at the time was so broke he couldn't really afford to leave the Navy and instead took the position. After that ship was completed, Nicholson ended up staying on as the commandant of the Charlestown Navy Yard where that first ship was built and where USS Constitution is still docked today. Nicholson ended up spending the remainder of his life in that role, dying in 1811. Dealing with poor performing ships as well as poor performing captains was not making the logistics of deploying the new Navy any easier for Benjamin Stoddard. 
He realized that in order to truly defeat the French privateers, they weren't going to be able to just patrol the American coastline, but would have to take the war to the enemy in the Caribbean. This demanded the presence of the new frigates, and once they became available in the summer of 1798, Stoddard began organizing a plan to establish squadrons of American ships built around the frigates that would deploy at specific locations that were key to the merchant trade off the coast of Havana, uh, off, the coast of, off the coast of Cuba, Hispaniola, and the Leeward and Windward Islands. There, for the next two years, American Navy ships would begin not only seizing privateers, but protecting and convoying American merchant ships back and forth from the Caribbean islands to the American seaports. <laughs> 